During this semester, we use probability distributions to run hypothesis tests and to calculate confidence intervals. We've used seven probability distributions this semester. Let's look at them quickly. The first one was a binomial distribution. Here's one with 12 trials and a probability of success on an individual trial of 35%. A uniform distribution. You need, you need to know what the minimum value is and what the maximum value is. In this case, it's a uniform distribution with a minimum of 4 and a maximum of 10. For a normal distribution, you need to know the population mean and the population standard deviation. The standard normal curve is a particularly important normal curve. It has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. A T distribution looks an awfully lot like a standard normal distribution. It has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation somewhat larger than 1. Here's a T distribution with degrees of freedom of 5. We used an F distribution to, to do a hypothesis test for the equivalence of variances. Here's an F distribution. F distributions need two degrees of freedom. The first degree of freedom in this one is 5 and the second one is 7. A chi-squared distribution, we use that to study goodness of fit and homogeneity. Here's a chi-squared distribution with a degree of freedom of 5. For each one of these distributions, we need to recognize a connection between a probability equation. In this case, the probability that x is less than 7 is equal to a particular amount. And a picture, here's 7 on that x-axis, and there's the probability of being less than 7 in this chi-squared distribution with the degree of freedom of 5. Now think in more general terms for a moment. Think of a probability that x is less than c is equal to some probability. The c value and the a value are connected. If you know one of them, you should be able to find the other. If you know the other, you should be able to find the one. In the particular chi-squared distribution that we looked at, the probability that x is less than 7 is equal to well, that's almost 78%. Luckily, R has two functions. One is called a probability function. In this case, P, for probability, P chi-square of 7, 5 degrees of freedom returns this value of nearly 78%. R also has a quantile function. In this case, if we look at the quantile, Q chi-squared, of that area, with 5 degrees of freedom, it returns a value of 7. There is a probability function and a quantile function for each probability distributions that we have studied. These functions are named in a way to help remind you of which probability distribution they're working with. An important thing to notice is that these are all associated with the probability equation the variable is less than some c value. We're interested in solving three types of probability equations. One, where the probability of the variable is less than c. Two, when the probability of the variable is greater than c. Three, the probability the variable is between two values. We'll examine examples of each of these. The chi-squared example that we've been discussing looks at the probability where the variable x is less than some constant is equal to an area. Here's another example of a t-distribution. The probability that t is less than 1.5 is equal to around 91%. As promised, the pt function of 1.5 returns that 91%. qt of that 91% with the 8 degrees of freedom returns the 1.5. So if the problem we're trying to solve comes from this first type of a probability equation, then the built-in probability and quantile functions in R solve the problem. Solving the other two types of problems will need to be done because we understand something that allows us to convert those problems to the first type or in some way use the first type to solve the problem.
We're working here with probability distributions. One feature of a probability distribution is that the total area under the curve is 1. For example, in this chi-squared distribution that we've looked at already, at a c value of 7, there's an area below 7, and there's an area above 7. The total of those two areas is 1. This is what allows us to solve the type 2 probability equation. So in the chi-squared example that we're looking at, if we were trying to solve the probability that x is greater than 7, find out what that b is, we could use p chi-squared of 7 with 5 degrees of freedom. That would tell us what a is, and if we take 1 minus a, then that's going to tell us what b is. On the other hand, if we know what b is, then we could find what a is, by looking at 1 minus b, and therefore q chi squared of 1 minus b, which is really a, returns the value of 7 that we needed. A similar strategy works for each of the other probability distributions. Here we're looking at the t distribution again. There's an area a and there's an area b. The total of those two areas, the area below 1.5 plus the area above 1.5 equals 1, so if we're trying to find the probability that x is greater than 1.5, then we could do that by looking at the pt of 1.5. That would tell us the area in a. If we subtracted that from 1, that would tell us the area in b. And if we knew the value of b, this area, then we could find 1 minus b which would be A, and QT of A would tell us this C. Let's recap what we've done and what we need to, to yet solve. We've been looking at solving probability equations. R has a built-in probability function and a built-in quantile function that solves the first type of probability equation. Since we're working with probability distributions, we know that the total area under a curve is 1, and that fact helps us solve the second type of probability equation. In this section, we're going to look at strategies for solving the third type of the probability equations. The ideas presented here will work for any of the probability distributions that we've studied. We will look at a t-distribution with 8 degrees of freedom as our example. In this example, we're going to try and find the probability that a t-value ends up between a negative 2.25 and a negative 1.15. In other words, this green area. The probability t function in R can calculate two different areas. One is the area below negative 1.15, and the other, pt of a negative 2.25, tells the area below a negative 2.25. So our desired area, that green area, is found by taking the area below a negative 1.15, subtracting the area below a negative 2.25. The inverse problem for the third probability equation is ill-posed. By that we mean that if C is known, there are an infinite number of choices of A and B that make this equation true. To illustrate that, think of this example. Suppose we wanted to solve the probability that z is between a and b, that that probability is equal to 25% in a standard normal distribution. It's easy to find a value so that 25% of the population is above that value. That means that if if a is any one of the values below that amount, it easily be a b value so that 25% of the population would be between A and B. However, solving for A in this equation is well defined in special cases. The special cases are distributions that are symmetrical about the mean and where the mean is equal to zero. For the distributions that we've studied, there are only two that satisfy these two conditions. They are the standard normal distribution and the t distribution. So in a standard normal distribution, let's find the a so that the z's that are between minus a and a are 87% of the area under the curve. Here's the script that does that job in the textbook, and in class we talked about the geometry that explains the reasoning behind that script. And here's a picture of that area. 
So let's talk a little bit about how your mastery of these concepts will be measured on the final exam. These concepts make inferential statistics possible. Your mastery of the concepts are measured indirectly each time you run a hypothesis test or calculate a confidence interval. Your mastery will also be assessed directly in the following two ways. One, generally through a graph to probability equation to solutions, and two, specifically from a probability equation to a graph to a solution. Let's look at some specific examples. In the general situation, you'll be given a graph with a shaded region in one of the probability distributions. You will be responsible for producing the associated probability equation, the script to find the area given the boundary values, and the script to calculate the boundary values given the area. So here's an example of a standard normal distribution with a value C and an area to the right of C. Your job is to find three things. The probability equation associated with this picture. In this case, that probability equation is the probability that Z is greater than C is equal to A. Number two, if you know what C is, Find the code that would tell you what A is, and that's the R code that does that job in this case. The third thing is, if you know what A is, find the R code that tells you what C is, and that's the code that does that job. Those three things are found from this picture. You should be able to do that for any one of the probability distributions that we've studied. So here's an example of a chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom, whatever df is, to identify the probability equation, which says that the probability that x is less than c is equal to that area A. The R script that finds A, given that what C is, is this R script. Notice that in this case we're going to have to use the P chi square function in R, and we have to use de that degree of freedom. That has to be known. Secondly, if we know what A is and we need to find out what C is, that's the script that does it. So now let's look at some final exam assessment questions where you begin with a probability equation, then you produce a graph, and from that you produce a solution. In this problem, we want to sketch the graph of a probability equation in a standard normal distribution. This is a standard normal curve, so we'll use z for our variable. In a standard normal curve, the mean is at zero. The standard deviation is one. The high point of the curve is at right at the mean, at zero, and the height at one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below the mean is about 60% of the high point. The curve is concave down within one standard deviation of the mean, and it's concave up outside of one standard deviation of the mean. So there's a relatively accurate sketch of a standard normal curve. So let's turn our attention to this probability equation. We're interested in the z values of 0.25. Here's 0, 1, there's 0.5, so 0.25 would be about right here, and 1.5, there's 1, there's 2, so 1.5 is about here. Our interest is in the z values between 0.25 and 1.5. So there's the associated area that we're interested in, and from that we could probably make an, a visual estimate for what this probability is. In this problem, we began with the probability equation. That equation was translated to a graph. This was a standard normal curve. And now we'll try to calculate what that area is, the missing variable in the equation. We know that P norm of 1.5 would tell me the area above the z values that are less than 1.5, this area. And we also know that P norm of 0.25 would tell me the area here, that is the area above the z values that are less than 0.25. So therefore, if we take P norm of 1.5 minus P norm of 0 0.25, we get that area that we're looking for. 
In this problem, we're looking at a standard normal distribution. Our desire is to find the C and minus C so that 70% of this distribution between minus C and C. The first step is to sketch a standard normal distribution. Here we've done that. It has a mean of zero, a standard deviation of one. There's the high point is at the mean. One standard deviation above, or 60% of the high point. Concave down within one standard deviation of the mean, and concave up outside of one standard deviation. Our interest is to find a C value and a minus C value so that 70% of the population is between those two values. What we know is in a normal distribution, very close to 68% of the population is within one standard deviation. So therefore I know that my C and minus C are a little bit larger than one and a little bit smaller than a minus one. We're interested in the Z values between minus C and C. So there's our picture. We want to have the centered area being 70% of the population and we need to find this C and minus C that makes that happen. So here we've started with the probability equation. We've produced a graph that represents that probability equation. And our desire is to find the C and the minus C so that 70% of the population is centered in this standard normal distribution. This is a script that we've studied before. The geometric interpretation of that script and why it works has been explained in class and in the textbook.